So, uh, very good morning to all of you. Today we will be having a class on periodontal uh, pockets. From this class, I we would uh, like you to know uh, what is the classification of periodontal pockets. How do you explain the pathogenesis of periodontal pocket formation? What are the contents and the walls of the periodontal pocket? Demonstrate the clinical presence. How are you going to demonstrate the clinical presence of the periodontal pocket in a patient? And uh, outline all the three possible treatment modalities uh, present for elimination of a uh, periodontal pocket. Coming on to the contents of the slide contents of the lecture uh, includes uh, introduction, classification, the clinical features, theories of pocket formation, pathogenesis, contents of pocket, detection of pockets, pocket therapy and then conclusion. So to start with, as you all know, gingival sulcus is a V-shaped shallow crevice or space around the tooth bounded by the surface of tooth on one side and uh, the epithelial lining the free margin on the other side so supposing if the uh, pocket uh, if the gingival sulcus is a little deepened uh, either because of any pathology in that case we term it as pocket so a pathologically deepened gingival sulcus is termed as pocket so this deepening could be because of just the coronal movement of the gingival margin that this v-shaped uh, uh, area becomes a little longer uh, as in the case of gingival enlargement or it could be because of an apical displacement of the gingival attachment apparatus like in the case of a true pocket. So in both these cases we call the term uh, of increase in the uh, gingival sulcus depth to be as a pocket. So coming into the classifications on the basis of loss of attachment it has been classified as gingival pocket or false pocket or pseudo pocket and uh, periodontal pocket true pocket or absolute pocket so uh, gingival pocket is one which is formed by just the gingival enlargement so as such there is no destruction of the underlying periodontal tissues the sulcus depth is increased because of the increased bulk of the gingiva so as since there is no destruction of the underlying periodontal tissues, we call this as a false pocket or a pseudo pocket. But on the other hand, periodontal pocket, true pocket or absolute pocket occurs because of the destruction of this underlying tissues. This leads to progressive deepening leading to the uh, destruction of the supporting periodontal structures and this further affects the bone and it might even result in loosening and exfoliation of your teeth. According to the relationship of the alveolar crust, it has been classified as supraboni and infraboni. So in this case, uh, supraboni pockets, supracrustal or supraalveolar are the other terms. So if the bottom of the pocket is just coronal to the underlying bone. So you can see this is the bottom of the pocket and this is the alveolar bone. But the level of this is just coronal that it is above this uh, alveolar bone and therefore it is called as a supraboni pocket. Same way if the bottom of the pocket is below the or uh, apical to the level of the adjacent alveolar bone then we term it to be a in intraboni pocket or infraboni pocket subcrustal or the intraalveolar pocket. So the main differences between supraboni and infraboni pocket. So the first one, first and foremost, is your uh, base of the pocket where it is present. If it is going to be present coronal, then we, if it is going to be present coronal, then we call it as a supraboni pocket. If it is going to be present a little below also, then we call it to be an infraboni pocket. And in this case, the bo uh, a bone destructive pattern is horizontal. Whereas in case of an infraboni uh, pocket, you can see that the bone destruction is vertical. It will be either vertical or an angular bony defect. Interproximally, the fibers are also restored uh, restored during the progressive uh, periodontal disease. They are arranged horizontally, whereas in case of your infraboni pockets, they are arranged a little oblique. On the facial and the lingual sides, the pedial fibers beneath the pocket follow a course of this uh, a normal horizontal oblique course between the tooth and the bone. Since the bone is having a horizontal bone loss, even the fibers will be having a horizontal, normal horizontal pattern of arrangement. And here, since it is an angular type of bone loss, the fibers also will be more of an angular type of arrangement. According to the involved tooth surfaces, it has been classified as uh, three types 
simple if it's going to involve just one surface like for example if it's involving only the mesial surface we call it to be a simple kind of pocket if it's going to involve more than two surfaces like if it's going to involve both the mesial as well as the buccal surface then we call it to be a compound surface or uh, involves just two surfaces if it's going to be more than two surfaces then we term it to be a complex surface for example there's a term called a spiral type of pocket so this pocket starts at the furcation it moves sometimes around the tooth and opens itself at the other side of the uh, tooth so such pocket is called a spiral pocket so it, since it involves more than two surfaces depending on the nature of the pocket it has been classified as uh, inflammatory uh, pocket wall or a fibrotic pocket wall so the main reason behind that uh, inflammatory fluid and cellular exudates predominate in this case and the pocket wall is bluish red in color soft spongy friable with smooth shiny surface whereas in case of a five fibrotic pocket wall there is a predominance of newly formed connective tissues cells and fibers the pocket wall is more firm and pink in case of a fibrotic pocket wall then depending on the disease activity it is being classified as an active and an inactive pocket you will be able to find a gingiva which has bluish red or thickened uh, margins like this and sometimes this bluish vertical zone can go even up to the attached gingiva you can see a rolled uh, edge or an enlarged edematous gingiva in this cases uh, if elicited with the help of a probe you can see bleeding on probing present sometimes suppuration if there is going to be more amount of suppuration and bone loss there could be mobility extruded tooth and even diastema formation patients who complain come to you come with a complaint uh, of localized pain or pain deep in the bone in that case have a suspicion of pocket so they usually have this problem they do have other problems such as foul taste and one of the major complaints from the patient uh, having pockets would be that they have bleeding gums so your idea should really strike to the fact that there has been some plaque and there has been some periodontal destruction activity going on and because of that there is bleeding gums which is present there is there might be some sensitivity to cold or hot food which the patient may complain if there is going to be toothache in the absence of caries then your idea should strike that it should be because of pockets if there is going to be pus drainage or localized swelling then we can uh, tell that there is some pocket present and therefore the problem is occurring now coming on to the correlation of the clinical and the histopathologic features so uh, pockets as they appear outside uh, they do have certain uh, features which are there underlying uh, only if these features are present the outer surface like for example if it is going to be um, a soft and edematous the underlying features has to be present for it to be shown to be a soft and edematous structure outside clinically so we will go on with each of these features you will be able to understand it better so the first one is a bluish red discoloration so why does this occur it is because inside uh, the uh, histo inside the tissues or the cells you have uh, circulatory stagnation present so the, you are having a bluish red discoloration flaccidity it is because of the destruction of the gingival fibers smooth shiny surface it is because of the atrophy of the epithelium and the ed edema underneath pitting on pressure it is because of the edema and the degeneration sometimes the gingiva may be pink and firm this is because of the fibrotic changes which predominate and bleeding on probing so this is the very first sign which we notice uh, if a pocket is present so why does it bleed when we do probe a uh, probing it might be because of increased vascularity thinning of the degeneration of epithelium or proximity of the engorged vessel to the inner surface and pain while while probing uh, this is because there may be ulceration on the inner aspect of the pocket so uh, like how do you how when you touch the ulcer outside there is pain same way if there is going to be a pocket on the inner wall of the uh, if there is going to be a ulcer on the inner wall of the pocket you do have some amount of pain next pus by digital pressure the if there is going to be some suppurative inflammation in the inner wall you do have problem such as pus formation 
Now coming on to the theories of uh, pocket formation, there was various theories to tell how a pocket is getting formed. Uh, this is just for your information that various authors have put various theories, but the pathogenesis of pocket formation is the main thing. So they have devised the pathogenesis completely based on all these theories uh, with inclusions and exclusions. So the first theory to go with, uh, if there is, a, so this was put forward by Wilfred Frisch. So he has told that if there is going to be destruction of the gingival fibers, this results in the initiation of the pocket formation. But later it was proved that it is not so. Next uh, theory was by Gottlieb. So he had told that if there is going to be changes, the ch initial change of the pocket formation occurs in the symptom. The third theory by Eisenberg, he has told that stimulation of the junctional epithelium by inflammation rather than by that of the uh, destruction of the gingival fibers is a prerequisite for the initiation of the periodontal pocket formation. He was somewhat near to the uh, pathogenesis of pocket formation. The fourth theory given by Skillen, he had told pathologic destruction of the junctional epithelium due to infection or trauma can result in initial histologic changes in the packet pocket formation. Keith, he suggested that periodontal pocket is initiated by the invasion of bacteria at the base of the sulcus or the absorption of the bacterial toxins to the epithelial lining of the sulcus. Herman Bucks, he told pocket formation is initiated as a defect in the sulcus wall. Wilkinson's theory, he told that pocket formation could be a result of proliferation of epithelium on the lateral wall rather than uh, on the base of the pocket. That is, this is the lateral wall. So he has told that the changes could be on the lateral wall rather than the base of the pocket. And the two-stage formation by James and Consul. So they had told that the first change is the proliferation of the junctional epithelium and the second change is the loss of the superficial layers of the proliferated epithelium which produces the space of the pocket. The ninth theory which was put forward by Nichols, he was somewhat nearer to the uh, established pathogenesis of pocket formation. So he had told that inflammation is the initial change in the formation of the pocket wall. So of course, initial lesion in the development of periodontitis is the inflammation of gingiva in response to the bacterial challenge. So generally when you have a pop, when you have a pocket or when there is going to be plaque accumulation, you do have some amount of inflammatory changes which are going on. So in case of a healthy gingiva, there is always some amount of bacteria which are the healthy ones. You have cockite cells and the straight rods. But if there is going to be periodontal pocket formation, then there is a shift in your uh, bacterial contents, more of gram negative rods which includes your spirochetes and your motile rods. So different proportions of bacterial cells are pre present in the dental plaque. So now we will go on to the pathogenesis but before pathogenesis I would like to tell you what happens during the gingivitis stage because periodontitis is always preceded by gingivitis. So uh, Page and Schroeder they summarize this widely scattered studies on the pathogenesis of periodontal diseases. So uh, whenever there is going to be plaque accumulation, there are going to be certain stages which are going to occur. Like supposing the food patient, in ordinary terms, if the patient is going to leave some food deposits, it is going to result in the plaque formation next. So because of this, there is going to be certain changes which are going to occur in the tissue surface. So what are they and how are they staged? They are staged into four categories. So the very first stage is your initial lesion. So if plaque is allowed to stay for more than two days, that is two to the first two to four days, it results in certain changes. Like for example, the blood vessels, there is vascular dilatation with vasculitis. It might be infiltrated with more amount of neutrophils. Of course, neutrophils are the cells of first line of defense. So they come into play. Next, there is perivascular loss which is present. Sometimes um, there is increased amount of gingival fluid flow too. The second one, the second that is which extends from four to seven days is the early lesion where there is vascular proliferation with red apex and atrophic areas and here there is more amount of lymphocyte uh, predominance rather than neutrophils there's increased loss around the infiltrate resulting in erythema and bleeding on probing so this first uh, sign that is bleeding on probing occurs as the first sign of uh, gingival 
disease formation this occurs during your early lesion the third stage is your established lesion which occurs 14 to 21 days after the plaque is left in the area so this has changes which includes both the stage 2 as well as blood stasis with more advanced destruction and here the plasma cells predominate over the other cells and there is continued loss of collagen and here you do have the first changes in the color texture and size so if it is going to be reddish blue reddish in color that is your uh, the gingiva is reddish in color which means that your gingiva the uh, stage of the disease is in the established lesion the fourth stage is your advanced lesion and this is similar to that and it moves on directly to your periodontitis from that stage so generally um, as told you already pocket formation occurs because of the inflammatory changes which are occurring in the connective tissue wall of the gingival wall uh, gingival sulcus the cellular and the fluid inflammatory exudate causes degeneration of the connective tissues including the gingival fibers so because of this what happens is that the area just apical to the junctional epithelium supposing this is your junctional epithelium just apical to this junctional epithelium the collagen fibers here are getting destroyed and this area becomes occupied by the inflammatory cells and the edema so um, Collagen fibers, they are getting destroyed. Uh, this occurs by means of two mechanisms. What are they? So, mechanism of collagen loss is by two mechanisms. One is an extracellular mechanism where the cells such as fibroblasts, polymorphonuclear leukocytes and macrophages release enzymes called as collagenases, results in degradation of the collagen and this might uh, divide this collagen into small peptides called as matrix metalloproteinases. On the other hand, there may be intracellular uh, collagen loss also present. So this, uh, as you all know, fibroblasts are the cells which are responsible for both destruction as well as construction of the collagen. Fibroblasts during the destructive phase phagocytize the collagen fibers extending the cytoplasmic process and degrade the uh, inserted collagen fibers. So that is mainly a phagocytosis of the collagen fibers taking place. So, so this results in collagen loss. So as we were told that uh, there is going to be some amount of collagen loss which is going to take place just apical to the uh, there is going to be some amount of collagen loss which is going to take place just apical to this junction epithelial area so if this area is getting freed up the apical cells of this junction epithelium tries to proliferate along the root uh, so when the apical cells proliferate along the root, the coronal portion uh, detaches from the root as the apical portion migrates. So as this moves downwards, the coronal portion also detaches from the mode root and moves downwards, thereby resulting in increased amount of deepening of this gingival sulcus. So when all this is occurring, the PMNs which are there inside increases in the coronal part mainly. So this results when the uh, percentage is around more than 60 percentage of uh, polymorphonuclear leukocyte, I mean neutrophils, more than uh, 60 percentage, then there is going to be tissue loss and cohesiveness. Uh, it loses its cohesiveness. Since it loses its cohesiveness, it starts to detach from the tooth surface and move down totally, resulting in a complete uh, pocket formation. The sulcus bottom shifts apically shifts apically and the oral circular epithelium occupies a gradually increasing portion of your circular pocket lining which is present so thus a pocket is getting formed so uh, this is a vicious cycle where uh, initially when there is going to be plaque accumulation if you're not going to take care of removing it then it is going to lead to gingival inflammation and even if it is not going to be treated at this phase then it goes to pocket formation and if there is going to be pocket formation then in that case uh, if we are not going to we are, the patient will not be able to clean it very efficiently resulting in more amount of plaque, form, plaque formation and this becomes a vicious cycle like this so the rationale for pocket reduction is based on the uh, on the need to eliminate the areas of plaque accumulation so 
so here you can see how uh, a pocket uh, a pocket is present so if there is going to be any plaque formation deep inside it is going to be very difficult to be removed with a conventional toothbrush so for this the dentist need to come into assistance for removal uh, by means of professional scaling and the root cleaning mechanisms now coming on to the lateral wall of the pocket so this is the wall which is present just adjacent to the uh, gingival sulcus so this shows severe degenerative changes the epithelial cells show striking proliferative and degenerative changes densely infiltrated with leukocytes edema from the inflamed connective tissue progressive degeneration and necrosis of the epithelium results in ulceration of the lateral wall exposure of the underlying inflamed connective tissue and suppuration sorry yeah the sixth area is your ulcerative area with exposed connective tissue and your seventh area is area with hemorrhage resulting in numerous erythrocytes so this is your micro topography of your gingival wall next uh, coming on to pockets as healing lesions so uh, pockets are chronic inflammatory lesions where complete healing does not occur this is because of the persistence of the bacterial attack which continues to stimulate an inflammatory response causing degeneration of elements uh, formed at the time of the repair so pockets they are um, they are they will be if present they are going to be present and it is how they are going to present whether there are constructive tissue changes occurring or destructive tissue changes occurring. Occurring. so this is shown outside in the form of color consistency or surface texture so if there is going to be destructive tissue changes you could see a reddish blue color consistency being soft uh, I mean uh, pitting consistency soft consistency and the surface texture where the stippling is absent whereas if there is going to be constructive changes you could see a very pink firm color present with increased amount of uh, uh, I mean uh, stippling present and uh, consistency is going to be firm and resilient so uh, pockets if they are present it is just a balance between whether it is going to be the constructive changes which is predominating or the destructive changes which is predominating now coming on to the contents uh, the contents mainly are microorganisms and their products in which is present in the pro pockets it could be uh, enzymes endotoxins or other metabolic products it could be food remnants salivary mucin gingival fluid dequamated epithelial cells or the leukocytes now coming on to the root surface so you could ask me that pocket is a soft tissue change which is occurring but uh, root surfaces also get significantly affected because they perp they may perpetuate the periodontal infection causes pain and this could complicate the periodontal treatment how so if a pocket deepens the collagenous remnants of the sharpest fibers in the cementum undergo degeneration resulting in the penetration of the bacteria in the cemento dentinal junction resulting in fragmentation and breakdown of the cementum surface as a result of this areas of necrotic cementum are separated from the tooth by masses of bacteria so here you can see a change where um, the sharpest fibers are inserted into the uh, tooth surface and whenever there's going to be some amount of pocket present the sharpest fibers starts to undergo degeneration resulting in penetration of the bacteria in the cemento dental junction and breakdown of the cementum surface so root surfaces also have a problem when there is going to be a pocket which may uh, be told by the patient like uh, sensitivity during taking hot or cold food so that time it should strike to you that there has been a problem with the tooth surface too the first zone is your calculus second is your attached plaque third is your unattached plaque fourth is the zone of um, junctional epithelium which is attached to the tooth fifth is a partially lysed connective tissue fibers so the third fourth and fifth zone has been called as a plaque free zone Next, coming on to the periodontal disease activity. So, generally, when there is a per, uh, pocket present or destruction going on, there are two periods of uh, uh, present side to side. So, it doesn't mean that if there is going to be destruction, it's going to be destruction always. 
so it is always a period of quiescence or inactivity followed by a period of exacerbation or uh, more amount of activity so during the periods of quiescence you can see there is reduced inflammatory response little or no loss of bone and clinical attachment loss but in case of exacerbation you see that there is more amount of unattached plaque with gram negative motile and anaerobic bacteria Bo uh, the bone loss and clinical attachment loss is present and the pocket deepens as such site specificity so periodontitis is termed to be a site specific disease why so periodontal destruction occurs on a few teeth at a time or even uh, only some aspects of some teeth at any given time it is very common to find sites of periodontal destruction next to sites with little or no destruction severity of periodontal destruction increases the development of new disease sites and increase breakdown of existing sites now coming on to the relation of attachment loss and bone loss to the pocket depth so before going in what is uh, at, uh, pocket depth and relationship of attachment loss we will see what is clinical attachment level so uh, you can see a picture here where the pocket depth is same in all the three categories so can you see that the pocket depth is same in three all the three categories but the amount of destruction in this particular tooth is very much severe correct but since we calculate the pocket depth from the gingival margin to the base of the sulcus we find that we are lacking in our uh, estimation of the destructive activity so for this the authors have suggested to take a fixed reference point as a uh, point for finding how much amount of destructive activity is going on so this fixed reference point is your cemento enamel junction so the distance from the cemento enamel junction to the base of the pocket is called as the clinical attachment level and if there's this is more then it is considered to be more uh, deleterious in nature when compared to a surface like this where there is no destruction at all but the pocket level is just the same for both so clinical attachment level is considered to be the distance between your fixed reference point that is your cj to the base of the pocket so the severity of the attachment and bone loss is generally but not always correlated with the depth of the pocket pockets of same depth may be associated with different degrees of attachment loss and pockets of different depths may be associated with same amount of attachment loss now coming on to the uh, detection of the pockets how are you going to detect the presence of the pockets so the only accurate method is by means of careful exploration with the help of periodontal port pro but it, this cannot be detected with the help of a radiograph because it is going to be a soft tissue chain and radiographs only depict your hard tissue structures changes such as bone changes only it will be able to depict but even if you want to see uh, a pocket uh, presence then in that case you need to insert a gutta perka point or a calibrated silver point uh, into the pocket and then take a radiograph to visualize how much is the pocket depth but again probing depth depends on a number of features such as direction of penetration of the probe the force which you are going to exert the size of the probe the resistance of the tissues and the convexity of the crown which is present and there are there are two types of pocket depths present one is called as the biologic pocket depth another is called as a clinical probing pocket depth so generally biologic pocket depth is one the distance between the base of the pocket and the gingival margin so th this base of the pocket is termed to be the coronal end of your junctional epithelium so this is very difficult to find out because there may be some hindrance uh, in terms of calculus or it in terms of your uh, proper handling of the uh, probe so whatever we do is the clinical or the probing depth which is the distance of penetration of the probe into the pocket so this is what we are always finding out whether it is a um how much it is penetrating into the pocket and coming on to the probing technique probe is generally inserted parallel to the long axis of the tooth and walked circumferentially around each tooth surface to detect areas of deepest penetration so this is called as walking around the around with a probe now coming on to the generation of the probes filstrom has categorized these five generations the very first generation of probes 
by the conventional probes which you could see here these are just the manual probes the second generation of probes came with a controlled uh, force application so these are the second generation probes the third generation of probes came with a uh, control force application along with a uh, manual device like i mean an automated device for measurements and computerized data capture the fourth generation device it aims at sequential probe rec probe positions along the along with the gingival sulcus the fifth generation probes they had an ultrasonic device attached to the fourth generation probes for identifying the attachment level without penetrating it itself again fourth and fifth are still in the, in the developmental stage we are having the uh, we usually go on with the first generation probes those under the um, research activities move on with the second and the third generation probes now coming on to the methods of pocket therapy there are three methods so either we could result in new attachment technique that is totally uh, by eliminating the pocket depth by uniting reuniting the gingiva to the tooth so this may lead to filling in of the bone and regeneration of the periodontal ligament and cementum so this is a little difficult feature to achieve but it is achievable next you could either correct the pocket work whereby uh, doing certain procedures like cure attach you can result in shrunk retraction or shrinkage of the pocket work or surgical removal of the pocket work or apical displacement of the pocket work or you can correct the tooth side of the pocket either by means of extraction or partial extraction that is root resection or hemisection pocket therapy it could be every time start it with a non surgical phase and then enter into a surgical phase so non surgically for the first and foremost we are going to go on with scaling and root planing so scaling is a procedure of removing of your uh, food substances from the tooth surfaces and root planing you are going to debride most of the structures in the root area that you are going to plane it into a smooth structure or by means of local drug delivery with the help of antibiotics or agents which are available surgically you could do curettage gingivectomy flap surgery or distal molar surgery again flap surgery can be of two types it could be a resective flap surgery or a reconstructive flap surgery with its flaps with its respective flaps present so to conclude i would like to sell that periodontal pocket formation causes loss of attachment of the gingiva and denudation of the root surfaces the severity of the attachment loss is not always associated with the depth of the pocket so as i told you already through that picture that uh, the amount of attachment loss is more uh, and it describes the destruction of the periodontal disease periodontal pockets of same depth may be associated with very clinical presentation and the pockets of different depths may be associated with same amount of attachment loss so presence of pocket periodontal pocket can act as a marker of the disease but do not correlate with the severity of the periodontal disease thank you very much